Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. It is time for Unearthed. Ta-da! If you're new to this show, this is the time when we talk about things that have been literally or figuratively unearthed over the last few months. Back when the pandemic started, I really wasn't sure how it was going to affect these episodes because a lot of the things that we talk about come from archaeological digs and on-site work at historical sites and museums, and a lot of that in a lot of the world has either been suspended or cut way back for at least part of the last year. But uh, there's still been plenty of stuff to talk about. <laughs> Enough stuff in the first three months of this year that we have two parts to this episode. Uh, Today, we will have the updates to previous episodes of the show. We will have cute animals and their pictures, um, which I was kind of delighted by finding enough stuff to categorize that way. Also, edibles and potables and shipwrecks. And the next time, we will have the exhumations and the books and letters and some other favorites in part two. In May of 2018, we talked about Pirate Henry Every, whose 1695 ambush of the Mughal ship Ganji Sawai caused an international incident and led to a worldwide manhunt. Every was last seen in Ireland in 1696, but then he vanished. So, for the first of these updates, in 2014, a metal detectorist found a coin with Arabic writing at Sweetberry Farm in Rhode Island. It has since been confirmed that this coin was minted in Yemen in 1693, and there aren't really any records of contact between the Arabian Peninsula and this part of New England quite that early. So one conclusion is that this coin belonged to the escaped pirate or one of his crew, and that it was part of the plunder from the Ganji Suai. Since that 2014 discovery, 15 similar coins have been found across Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and Connecticut, There was also one found in North Carolina where some of Every's men are documented as arriving. Jim Bailey, who unearthed that coin at the Berry Farm, published his research into all of this in the American Numismatic Society's Colonial Newsletter, which is now known as the Journal of Early American Numismatics in 2017. Bailey suggests that Every and some of his crew left the Bahamas aboard the Seaflower, which arrived in Newport, Rhode Island, on May 30th, 1696. The Seaflower was carrying 47 enslaved Africans and is often described as the first slave ship to arrive in Newport, which later became one of North America's primary slave trading ports. The crew of the Seaflower sold 14 of the enslaved people aboard before departing for Ireland, arriving there in late June. So there are historical accounts of the Seaflower. Some of them are from members of Every's pirate crew, some of them are from officials. And the physical descriptions of the ship don't match up among these different accounts. Bailey concludes that they really are all describing the same ship, that they're not different ships that happen to be named the Seaflower, and that these inconsistencies in the description are the result of inaccurate record-keeping and just the passage of time between when the ship arrived and when John Cranston, who was the governor of Rhode Island, described it in a report about the slave trade in the colony. There have been a lot of recent headlines about this find maybe solving the mystery of what happened to Henry Every. And it definitely seems possible that these coins are part of the plunder from the Ganji Sawai, but if so, it still doesn't really solve the mystery. Every's reported arrival in Ireland was after this. Yeah, also, uh, all this additional detail about this 2017 paper came about because the latest uh, article to circulate about this was dated April 1st. It's the only April unearthing that we have in this episode. Uh, That raised some questions in my mind about whether it was legitimate. We talked about the ancient Greek astronomical calculator that I adore, known as the Antikythera Mechanism, on the show in July of 2013. And it and the shipwreck it was found in have come up on Unearthed since then. That device was discovered in 1901, and researchers have figured out a lot about it since then, including developing working replicas, hand-cranked devices that demonstrate the motion of planetary bodies. 
But researchers only have about a third of the actual mechanism to go on. So even these replicas have had to incorporate some guesswork. You can turn a crank and the hands on the face move to show positions for the sun, the moon, and five planets that were known to antiquity. So in that sense, these replicas work. But the motion and the positions of the hands that hasn't completely matched up with all the data that can be gleaned from the surviving pieces of the device. According to research published in the journal Scientific Reports in March, researchers have closed some of that gap between a working device and a working device that matches all the data. In the words of lead author Professor Tony Freeth, quote, ours is the first model that conforms to all the physical evidence and matches the descriptions in the scientific inscriptions engraved on the mechanism itself. The sun, moon, and planets are displayed in an impressive tour de force of ancient Greek brilliance. And to quote from the actual paper, quote, we wanted to determine the cycles for all the planets in this cosmos, not just the cycles discovered for Venus and Saturn. To incorporate these cycles into highly compact mechanisms conforming to the physical evidence, and to interleave them so their outputs correspond to the customary cosmological order, or CCO. Here we show how we have created gearing and a display that respects the inscriptional evidence, a ring system with nine outputs, moon, nodes, Mercury, Venus, Sun, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and date, carried by nested tubes with arms supporting the rings. The result is a radical new model that matches all the data and culminates in an elegant display of the ancient Greek cosmos. It sounds so poetic. It does. For a paper. <laughs> <laughs> well written. Bravo. Um, Switching gears, attorney David Whitcomb bought an old building in Geneva, New York, to expand his law practice and discovered an attic space totally by surprise. From the outside, the building didn't look like it had an attic, and there hadn't been an attic noted on the floor plans or known to the previous owner. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, (laughs) When he got inside that space, it turned out to contain drop cloths, portrait stools, Kodak paper, developing chemicals, and portraits. And some of the portraits include people that we have talked about in several prior episodes of the show. One is a framed portrait of Susan B. Anthony. Another, maybe Elizabeth Cady Stanton. It turned out that this building had previously housed the studio of photographer James Ellery Hale, And it makes a lot of sense that there would be pictures of Anthony and Stanton in that studio. Geneva is really not far from Seneca Falls, New York. We actually stayed in Geneva for one of the live shows that we did in Seneca Falls. Uh, And that, of course, is home to the Seneca Falls Convention. Susan B. Anthony also lived in Rochester, which is also not that far away from Geneva. What isn't clear is why this space got sealed up with all kinds of portraits and equipment still inside of it. According to news reports, Whitcomb plans to donate some of the fines while auctioning others off. Uh, Next up, according to research published in the journal Antiquity, it's possible that some of the blue stones at Stonehenge were relocated from a different stone circle that had been dismantled, that other stone circle being in Wales. The blue stones are the smaller stones at Stonehenge, And it was already known that they had come from Wales, but it was not clear why they had been moved roughly 150 miles away from where they were quarried to build this stone circle. This paper's hypothesis is that Stonehenge's bluestones used to form a stone circle at Wine Mound, where there are only four bluestones remaining today. Both the former Wine Mound Circle and Stonehenge are aligned on the midsummer solstice sunrise, and one of the stones at Stonehenge has an unusual shape that matches one of the holes where a stone used to be at Wine Mound. There are still some unknowns here, if the stones really did used to be in this other circle. But one possibility is that the people who built the circle at Wine Mound or their descendants eventually relocated to the area around Stonehenge and they dismantled their stone circle and they brought it with them. Uh, We did a whole unearthed edition of Stonehenge on the show in 2014. So in previous installments of Unearthed and in prior episodes of the show that have involved colors and dyes, we have talked about blue and purple dyes made from marine animals from the Mediterranean Sea. 
There are written descriptions of the dyes themselves and of dyed textiles. And we've talked about various finds related to dye making, like pots containing residues of blue or purple dye, or places where an abundance of snail shells suggests that there was a dye factory there. Now, a team in the Timna Valley has found wool fibers dating back to 1000 BCE, which have been dyed Tyrian purple. So one of these dyes that we've been talking about. This is the first time that a textile dyed with this specific color has been found in the Southern Levant, and it dates back to the same time as biblical accounts of this dye. We have talked about new finds at the Saqqara Necropolis in Egypt in our two previous installments of Unearthed, and those finds still ongoing. Recent finds include 50 new kingdom sarcophagi made of wood found in a burial shaft, a stone sarcophagus, a papyrus containing the 17th chapter of the Book of the Dead, and some games, including a senate set. So it's the last of this update section. We do have some other things that will come up later that uh, relate to earlier episodes, but... We have them in other categories, and for now, we are going to take a quick sponsor break. When I was going through all kinds of articles to put this together, I found a whole lot of depictions of animals. I have grouped them together as cute animal pictures, because it feels like after a time of pandemic for a year, we could all use more cute animal pictures in our lives. Uh, First up, archaeologists in Indonesia have found what they have described as the world's oldest known cave painting of an animal. It is a pig, and it is about 45,500 years old. A doctoral student named Basran Burhan actually found this painting back in 2017, but the findings from the survey were not published until this year in the journal Scientific Advances. The Sulawesi warty pig is a popular subject for cave art in this region. Before this particular discovery, the oldest dated rock art there was a different Sulawesi warty pig, and the paper detailing this particular find also goes into another Sulawesi warty pig depicted in the same area. I have thoughts. (laughs) Oh, about the pig? Are you going to save them for behind the scenes? Yeah. Okay. Next up, a team in Catalonia has found a stone plaque carved with images of at least six animals. There's a doe, a stag, two goat-like animals, and two other animals that were not yet identified as of when this article came out. This slab is between 11,000 and 15,000 years old, and the team found it after floods actually damaged an archaeological site. It eroded some of the uh, layers, the soil layers at the dig. Unfortunately, though, that flood damage also makes it harder to date the plaque because without the strata around it to use as a reference, its, uh, its exact age is a little unclear. A pair of Tang Dynasty tombs have been discovered in Shangxi Province in China, and they are decorated with murals, including some that show people training horses and leading camels. The tombs belong to an official who was in charge of horses, so it's possible that the murals are, in fact, related to his life in some way. Next up, researchers have used radiocarbon dating on 27 mud wasp nests to figure out that a rock painting of a kangaroo in Western Australia is the oldest intact rock painting uh, known so far on the continent. The wasp nests were both under and on top of this and similar paintings, and based on all this research, they determined that this painting is somewhere between 17,100 and 17,500 years old. This work, dating this particular painting, is part of a much bigger project to date rock paintings in Australia, and it's a team effort among universities, the Australian National Science and Technology Organization, and Aboriginal organizations. Next up, a 2,500-year-old bronze bull idol was unearthed in Olympia, Greece after a heavy rainstorm, thanks to an archaeologist noticing one of its horns sticking out of the soil. It most likely dates back to roughly uh, 1,050 to 700 BCE, and it was probably left as an offering to Zeus. This figurine is quite small. There are pictures of someone holding it in their fingertips while cleaning it, 
And it has slightly splayed legs, so even though it depicts a bull with fully developed horns, it looks kind of like a calf that's still a little unsteady on its hooves. Yeah, it's uh, it's more adorable than you might think that a bull <laughs> would be. It's one of those things that when I looked at the picture, I was like, he just noticed this sticking out of the store because it's tiny. It's really small, yeah. That's like going, oh, I did see a grain of rice in that field back there. Like, it's so, <laughs> it's so little. So moving on from depictions of animals to actual animals. Research at Durham University suggests that people making their way from Asia to the Americas roughly 15,000 years ago brought domesticated dogs with them. We already knew that domesticated dogs were present in parts of northern North America and some Pacific islands at least 10,000 years ago, but this genetic research gives them a common origin somewhere in Siberia more like 23,000 years ago. Similar research involving a bone fragment found in southeast Alaska suggests that it belonged to a dog that lived there around 10,150 years ago, but whose ancestry also stretched back to Siberia to a genetic line that branched off from Siberian dogs roughly 16,700 years ago. This particular team did not set out to study dogs, though. Before analyzing the DNA of the bone fragment, the team had actually thought it belonged to a bear. Next up, back in 2018, a couple living outside of Provo, Utah, found a nearly complete horse skeleton in their backyard. These bones were nicknamed the Lehigh Horse, and at first it seemed like they were about 10,000 years old. But subsequent radiocarbon dating suggests it's actually a much younger find. That radiocarbon dating combined with other analysis to suggest that this was really a female horse who was about 12 years old when she died, and that happened sometime in the 17th century, so not nearly 10,000 years ago. <laughs> not by a long shot. Based on analysis of the bones, this was a domesticated horse that people rode, which had arthritis in many of her joints by the time of her death. So it seems likely that someone intentionally cared for her, possibly breeding her with other horses when she couldn't carry riders any longer. And then after her death, she seems to have been intentionally buried in sand at the edge of a lake, which is why at first it had seemed like this was a much older skeleton than it really turned out to be. The paper's lead author, William Taylor, even speculated that there might be other remains of horses that were similarly intentionally buried, and because of that have been miscategorized as Ice Age finds rather than things that are a lot more recent. The team is hoping these findings will combine with indigenous oral history to shed new light into how indigenous peoples in the area cared for their horses. In the words of co-author Carlton Shield, Chief Gover, quote, there was a lot going on that Europeans didn't see. There was a 200-year period where populations in the Great Plains and the West were adapting their cultures to the horse. And our last cute animal, burrowing rabbits on Skokholm Island in Wales, have unearthed some prehistoric artifacts while digging their little burrows. One is a small tool known as a beveled pebble, which is about 9,000 years old and was probably used for processing things like shellfish and seal hides. And the other is a burial urn that's about 3,750 years old. When wardens stopped by the area after making these discoveries, they came back the next day, they saw that the rabbits had kicked out some other stuff, including another pebble and a piece of pottery. <laughs> I feel like these rabbits should get paid. Uh, there were travel restrictions in place, of course, due to COVID when these finds surfaced. But once those restrictions are lifted, it is expected that archaeologists will come in and look at all of this more thoroughly. We'll get to some other things after a quick ad break. Often in these episodes, I have it section that I call edibles and potables, and it's all the food and drink. But this time, there were several finds that were specifically about intoxicating substances, whether alcohols or like other mind and mood-altering substances. So I just looped those all together. Previously, historians of Edo, Japan, have generally concluded that during the Edo period, wine was only produced for about four years. And the reason that wine production was ended was that wine was closely associated with Christianity, and Christianity was prohibited in Japan during the Edo period. 
Now, researchers from Kumamoto University have found an Edo period document that adds a little more specificity to this general understanding. It's an order for wine, placed in September 1632, with notes about the order written on it. One of the notes being that the wild grapes for the wine had been provided to the vassal who was going to make it. This actually pushes out the date for the end of winemaking in Japan to 1632 from previously understood 1631. The Hosokawa clan was also ordered to move to another domain in January of the following year. It was that clan that had been making the wine, and there's no evidence at all of any winemaking in the new location after they moved. Moving on, researchers at Washington State University have analyzed 14 miniature ancient Maya flasks. And when we say miniature, (laughs) they measure about four centimeters across. For the first time, they found residues from something other than tobacco. In addition to two different types of tobacco, these small containers also held Mexican marigold, something that may have been added to make the experience of smoking the tobacco more pleasant. And on the other end of the size spectrum, archaeologists in Egypt found eight very large units at an ancient burial ground known as Abydos. And when we say very large, they were about 20 meters or 65 feet long and two and a half meters or eight feet wide. Each of these units contained two rows of pottery basins with 40 basins in each row. And that would have been used to heat up water and grains to make beer. These date back to sometime between 3150 BCE and 2613 BCE. And this may be the oldest beer factory in the area. So now we're going to move on to food. Uh, Research at Bronze Age mining sites in the Eastern Alps in Austria has examined how workers at the mines procured and prepared their food. From about the 11th to the 9th century BCE, mining at these sites became highly specialized, meaning that the people at the mines were probably focused on the mining and not doing other work. And there weren't many people living at the mines who would not have been mining. Earlier research has suggested that the miners' preferred meat to eat was pork. And while the pigs were raised somewhere else, the mines had facilities on site to cure the meat that they got. But there wasn't as much investigation into any plant-based foods that they might be eating until more recently. According to research that was published in March, the miners were eating cereals, but they were not processing the cereals themselves. So the grains were being hulled and milled somewhere else, and then the ready-to-cook grain was being delivered to the miners. It's also possible that they were being delivered ready-to-eat bread as well, which I am definitely on board with. Uh, So that means at least some of their cooking was also being done elsewhere. I would like bread delivery. Yes. (laughs) In our next subject, according to research published in the journal Antiquity, there's evidence of prehistoric salt production in Northeast England, dating back to 3800 to 3700 BCE. Prior to this discovery, the earliest conclusively known salt processing in England was from centuries after that. This conclusion came from the discovery of a chamber filled with flint tools and pieces of pottery, along with what appears to be hearths that were used to heat vessels containing brine. This may be one of the oldest salt processing sites in Western Europe. And in other salt news, researchers at Kalakmul, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, have been documenting the use of salt as a commodity among the Maya. The oldest depiction of salt there is from a mural that's somewhere around 2,500 years old. It shows a vendor holding what looks like a salt cake wrapped in leaves while someone across from them holds a spoon above a basket of what's interpreted as like a granular salt. Archaeologists have also unearthed what has been dubbed the Paynes Creek Salt Works, which is a massive salt processing facility on the coast of what's now Belize. In the words of archaeologist Heather McKillop, quote, I think the ancient Maya who worked here were producer vendors, and they would take the salt by canoe up the river. They were making large quantities of salt, much more than they needed for their immediate families. This was their living. Her paper, Salt as a Commodity or Money in the Classic Maya Economy, is being published in the June issue of the Journal of Anthropological Archaeology. Now we are going to move on to an ongoing favorite, which is the shipwrecks. 
First up, the Greek culture ministry has announced the discovery of a Roman-era shipwreck, along with evidence of several other shipwrecks off the coast of the island of Kassos. The Roman ship was loaded with amphorae, and these were made in what's now Spain and Tunisia, and some of them contained oil. The other three ancient ships discovered in the survey were also carrying amphorae, a popular thing to carry across the waterways around Greece. These discoveries came from more than 100 group dives carried out by a team of more than 20 specialists. And it's part of a three-year research project in the area that is finishing this year. So there could be more to come from all of this. Divers have also returned to the wreck of the Mentor, which is the ship that sank off the coast of Greece while carrying marbles that Lord Elgin had removed from the Parthenon. We have a whole episode about those marbles and how they went down in a shipwreck. Dives to this ship have been ongoing since 2009, and the most recent finds there connect to basically everyday life aboard the ship. So the team recovered an intact shoe sole, items of clothing, a belt buckle, and several pieces of the ship's rigging. They also found some chess pieces, which are probably part of the same set as some other chess pieces that have already been brought up. And in our last find for this episode, it's a little bit tricky to call this a discovery since the folks who had it knew it was there the whole time. But archaeologists have recently become aware of a 136-year-old wooden lifeboat that was being stored in the rafters of a hayshed in Western Australia. This lifeboat belongs to the Maid of Lincoln, which sank in 1891 while carrying a load of guano The captain, several members of the crew, and a stowaway were all able to escape the wreck in the lifeboat. The captain then gave the boat to the Grigson family, who helped them when they got to shore. For a time, this family used the boat for fishing, but eventually they put it up in the rafters of the hay shed, basically to get it out of the way. They weren't using it anymore. Stick it up in the rafters. Decades later, archaeologist Bob Shepard was shown around this property when one of the Grigsons said, Come have a look at this, Bob. (laughs) I love that. Uh, For now, this lifeboat is being safely stored so that it can be restored and preserved and then housed somewhere in the community. The family was pretty clear that they wanted it to stay in the general area. So that is it for Unearthed this time, but there's plenty more to come next time. We'll have more on Wednesday. (laughs) In the meantime, Tracy, do you have a, a spot of listener mail? I do. This is from Robin, and Robin says, Hello, Holly and Tracy. I want to start off by saying that I love listening to Stuff You Missed in History Class and the personal touches you both bring to the stories you tell. I've been wanting to email you about a subject that's close to my heart, especially when I heard you mention Ella Reeve Bloor, also known as Mother Bloor, in your Italian Hall disaster episode and her involvement in the labor movement. With this very brief mention, I saw my opening to write, but then 2020. I get it. (laughs) And nobody's going to fault you here, that's for sure. (laughs) On Monday, when I saw that your episode was about Esperanto, I knew it was a sign that I had to write. You may be asking what Esperanto and Mother Bloor have in common. Well, that would be Arden, Delaware. Mother Bloor lived in Arden, Delaware, which is located in northern Delaware, less than an hour away from Philadelphia. Arden is one of four remaining single-tax communities in the U.S. The other three are Ardentown, Ardencroft, and Fairhope, Alabama. Both Ardentown and Ardencroft, along with Arden, make up the Ardens in northern Delaware. These single-tax communities are based on the Henry George principle of tax land, not labor, or single tax. Mother Bloor lived in Arden almost from the very beginning of its founding in 1900 was founded in 1900 by Philadelphia artist Frank Stevens. Arden was originally a summer artist's colony for local artists to live in community to inspire each other, sell their wares, and get out of the city for the summer, which was marked by an end-of-season fair-slash-market. This fair-slash-market is still held today on the Saturday of Labor Day weekend. Within a few years, many of the summertime residents turned into year-long residents, including Mother Bloor and her family. Her son, Hamilton D. Buzz Ware, was one of the well-known artists to come out of Warden with his warehouse gallery located in Ardentown. One of the founding tenets of Arden was equality. All were welcome, no matter race or religion. Part of this equality was the use of Esperanto as a common language. In fact, the founder, Frank Stevens, was often called Patro, which is father in Esperanto, 
Today, Esperanto is not often spoken, but it is a big part of the founding of the village of Arden. Today, the Ardens are still part of the single tax movement, and many artists and artisans still call this place home. Pottery, painting, jewelry, and sculpture are just some of the crafts still practiced here today. We even still hold an annual end-of-summer fair to sell local artisans' wares on Labor Day weekend when not in a pandemic. Uh, Robin then uh, has some suggestions for episode topics that are connected to all of this. Uh, and says, thanks, Robin. Thank you so much, Robin, for this email. I had no idea of any of this. <laughs> not, uh, not this whole connection um, to Arden and uh, and the other Ardens or the, the single tax movement, any of that. So thank you so much for sending us an email full of so much interesting information. Um, we'll see. We'll see whether any of these suggestions eventually become episodes. We love getting suggestions Uh, The list is just really long, so it can be really hard to predict when something might make an appearance on the show. Um, So if you would like to write to us about this or any other podcast, we're at HistoryPodcast at iHeartRadio.com. And we're all over social media at Mist in History. That's where you'll find our Facebook, Pinterest, Twitter, and Instagram. And you can subscribe to our show uh, at Apple Podcasts and the iHeartRadio app and wherever you get your podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. <laughs>